Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. This evening, I'm privileged to welcome a multi award winning engineer. You may well have seen her on TV shows or heard her podcast, Building Stories, although she's best known for working on the design for the Shard. I encountered her during COVID restrictions while she was researching her latest book, Nuts and Bolts, which is a great read, by the way. And it's for that book that I invite her to join us tonight. So please give a warm bench talk welcome to Roma Agrawal. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, Roma, when did you did your interest in engineering begin? Um, that's a good question. So, so my argument would be that it started at the same time as everybody else, which is when we're young children, <laughs> and. You know, I've, I've got a four year old and I've been watching the fascination, how she loves fiddling around with stuff and breaking stuff and playing with things and bouncing them and throwing them just to discover what's happening. And to me, that's all part of um, engineering. But I, th I guess more officially, I always liked maths and science. I grew up, I spent a quite formative 10 years in India and we can go into a bit more detail about why that's I think important in my engineering journey and ended up studying physics but then thinking what do I actually want to use the physics for and then I did a master's in structural engineering which was a very unusual thing to do at the time like people didn't do a physics degree and then move into engineering um, but then I got a job and yeah spent about 14 years in the construction industry uh, well, you mentioned India there. Well, why don't we start with that? Why was that such a, an important factor? Yeah, no, I think it's it's very interesting, um, at least from my perspective, my experience of being in Mumbai in India was that engineering was actually one of the careers that parents really aspire their kids to pursue because it's well paid, it's respected, it's seen as a prestigious thing to do. You know, people, you know, parents want their children to become doctors, accountants, engineers, you know, which are all STEM careers, really. So I think it was very normal for people to like science or do well in science and maths. And gender really didn't play a role in, in that for me, really, until I started my undergraduate degree, where I thought, whoa, this is so unbalanced. Um, so, so I think I was lucky in the sense that science was just very much part of my almost like our culture and the DNA and my dad's an engineer my mum studied maths so it was never kind of I never questioned that or thought that I was strange for like in science. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that when you started your undergraduate uh, degree uh, when I started mine I, I did an engineering degree as well although in, in a different subject uh, there were two females in a group of 40. I, I guess it's yeah. probably something similar for you? Um, yeah, so I I went I did physics at Oxford, and I think we were about ten percent women. So I think there was about ten women in a class of a hundred ish. Um, and then when I did my masters in structural engineering, it was probably similar. But what I found really interesting was that uh, there were a lot of women from Europe, and actually the further east you go into Europe, the higher the percentage of women engineers is, which is which is also an interesting thing. That also ties in with the fact that engineering is taken far more seriously the further east you go, generally. Yes, possibly. I think, um, again, sort of growing up in India, I could see the big difference that, you know, infrastructure projects we're making, we, I mean, we still have the occasional power cut, but, you know, water supply issues, like all of these kind of things happen. And um, I guess you can kind of see the difference that engineering is making maybe firsthand. Whereas, I mean, I, I joke about this, and I'm sure most of you will agree that if you're in the UK and, you know, walking around in public sphere, the only time I really ever hear the word engineering is when it's being blamed for your train running late. So there's always quite a negative connotation around it. Yeah, the old engineering works. <laughs> yep, just those. <laughs> <laughs> well, going from your, your degree onwards, did you overcome any obstacles when trying to make it your career? I mean, I would say the biggest obstacle was the fact that I was going from physics to engineering and because that was such an unusual thing to do, I think a lot of them <laughs> trying to do here. Um, 
And so I applied for, I remember, about 40 positions. And I think I got three interviews and I got two job offers in the end, which was lovely. So I had a choice, which was, which was always lovely. But I, I, I think that that was a bit of a leap for a lot of companies. I mean, I'm going back to 2004 now, so nearly 20 years ago. And I would like to think that things have moved on a little bit since then. But I, for me, that was the biggest blockage. And then when I tried applying for membership to the engineering institutions, the ICE, this you know, Institution of Civil Engineers, basically just said, no, they won't take me on as a graduate engineer because I had a physics degree. So so those were almost the obstacles of like, ooh, physics, you know, we don't know quite what to do with that. And in my head, I'm like, I don't understand why you think this is very different than engineering. Uh, it's, it's hard to understand that. All right, well, let's get on to writing. How did, how did you get into writing? And can you tell us a little about your first book, Built? Um, of course. So uh, writing was never part of the plan. And I was you know doing my job i did a footbridge in newcastle which was my first project so then worked on the shard as you mentioned and i spent six years of my career on that and it was really because the shard was such a high profile iconic project that you know it started to capture the imagination of people i think particularly in london where people could see it going up and see the changes that were happening and they were very intrigued by the whole thing and probably a little bit irritated by all the road closures and construction noise and stuff i'm sure as well um, but me and my colleagues did a lot of technical presentations on the Shard. So we went around the world, to be honest, speaking to other engineers about our work on the Shard, about top-down construction techniques and the way we analyze the soil and how we did wind analysis. And I stopped counting um, once I'd done 100 presentations <laughs> of the Shard. But I think because of who I am, so I was the only um, person of color, I was a young woman um i was very different than the rest of my colleagues i started getting invitations from schools and universities to come and speak to the students and try and inspire them to consider a career in engineering and i found that i really really loved doing that so then i would instead of just speaking to engineers i started speaking to five-year-olds and to retired medics or to women or you know like very very different groups of people and i found that trying to break down complex engineering and make it interesting, inspiring, engaging for people um, was something I really loved and something that I felt needed to be done to try and keep people interested and attracted um, into you know, the, the various types of things that we do. Sure. Now I invited you to talk about your latest book, Nuts and Bolts, uh, to give it its full title, Seven Small Inventions That Changed the World in a big way. Uh, where did the idea for this book come from? Um, thank you. And I realized I didn't answer the question about my first book, which you asked about. So I'll quickly, quickly respond to that and then I'll come on to nuts and bolts. So, so yeah, so, the, so the, I guess the, the, the end of that story is that I was doing loads of presentations. I loved going out and speaking to people about engineering, people who weren't engineers. And then I thought, how can I reach um, as broad an audience as possible? And in the meantime, somebody said to me, would you like to write a book? And I thought, no, that's a terrible idea. I don't really like writing. Um, but I started having a few conversations and basically was slightly, well, I guess it was slightly in the right place in the right time, but I had also been establishing myself as somebody who could go and speak to about engineering to the general public. Um, I managed to get a book agent and then a book deal. So I wrote Built, and Built is mainly focused on the built environment and how we you know, it's the hidden stories behind our structures. So I cover everything from skyscrapers to bridges to sewage and water and that. Um, and I have a children's version of that, which is called How Was That Built? So if you've got any young people in your lives, then um, I would like to think it's a great present for them. And then, yes, Nuts and Bolts was my next one. And I think I was trying to think of ideas. So, so I had a baby in July 2019 and very quickly got very bored of maternity leave and being at home at the beck and call of this tiny human 24 hours a day. And so I started kind of pondering what different ideas I might have for a book. Then the pandemic hit, and I feel like all our lives became very small and inward looking. Um, and then I also kind of thought, oh, I've been focusing on really big pieces of engineering, big pieces of infrastructure for so long. 
but what are the kind of elements that actually make those big projects possible? So then I tried to kind of mentally deconstruct all the stuff around. So whether that was something like as simple as a can opener in my home or a blender or my laptop or a smartphone, all the way to like the buildings outside of me, thinking about what's underground, different types of technology. And I just started trying to make lists of what I think the most fundamental pieces were that allowed this more complex piece of engineering to exist. Um, and I ended up with this list of seven. So my list of seven are the nail, wheel, spring, lens, magnet, string, and pump. And I always have interested in discussions with people about why these seven, have I missed anything? They might, you, you, some of you might think that you've got ideas for what another one should be. Um, yeah, ultimately those are the seven that I picked and chose to uh, pursue. Uh, we talked or uh, well, discussed earlier which ones we might talk about this evening and, and we chose nails and string, uh, which I think will be great for this audience. Uh, so tell us about your experience hand forging a nail, which I read in the book. <laughs> I love that. So, um, so this was, I was telling somebody just over the weekend, I think it was my brother-in-law that I actually did wood woodworking in school. That was just part of my curriculum in India that we did woodworking. I think it was once a week or once every two weeks. And so I put together some, you know, different joints. They talked about mitre joints and dovetail joints and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I did design and technology for A level. So I always loved doing stuff with my hands in that sense. Um, and I just felt like it would be a really amazing experience to try and actually recreate how nails were made for centuries and thousands of years, to be honest, before mechanization happened, before the Industrial Revolution happened. And so I found this brilliant forge, and, and many of you may know of it, in Much Haddon. And that forge has been running continuously since about the mid-1800s. And there's this great um, ironmonger there called Rich, who, again, so this was kind of in the pandemic, probably a similar time to when I was in touch with you, Mitch. Um, so we kind of masked up and there was just the two of us in this forge staying far apart. But yeah, I, I did this nail um, and it took me a while. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I write in the book about how people were making you know, a hundred nails a day or something. But that, so, so maybe to, like to answer your question, I think for me, what stood out about the experience was the fact that I had a very theoretical knowledge of steel and of nuts and bolts and other things like that, different fasteners. I understood what forces they could take. I understood what kind of resins or things they might need if you're using a fastener, for example. I understood that you need to add a torque. Like it was, it was all very quite theoretical. But then the experience of actually forging the nail reminded me what a sensory feeling you get from actually doing things with your hands. So looking at the colors to determine how hot the metal was rather than a thermometer or listening to the clang change as you were um, whacking it and it changes pitch when it cools down or you know, the smell of the furnace and, and all of that stuff. And, yeah, I absolutely loved it. I, I mean, I have to say my biceps were pretty sore for a couple of days after, but it was brilliant. I remember doing a, a similar experience uh, at a forge and it's, it was a lot of fun, I found, an awful lot of fun. Yeah, it's, brilliant. Course, it's fantastic. But, you, he, you know, Rich was sort of laughing at me saying people want to come in and make all these elaborate things and you want to forge a nail. But he's like, that's that's the most important, most basic thing. So, yeah, it was great. And, and you got a, an idea of why they were so expensive when they were first being made. Absolutely. So between the material itself being expensive to mine and produce and purify and transport and so on, and then obviously the labor involved in creating them, um, nails were incredibly expensive. And, and I think, you know, I write in the book about some of the marginalized communities that um, were involved in nail making, so that includes women and children. So I told the story of Eliza Tinsley, who was a woman in the 19th century in the black country and her husband died and he had a nail and chain making business and she took it over, but expanded the business and was known as a humane employer. Um, 
I found a story about how men who were gen I, I suppose often minors aspired to marry a nailing wench because their wives could then earn a bit of extra cash by you know forming nails and then they would get their kids involved as well and then if we go to the states um i write about the story of thomas jefferson who seven years before he became president of the u.s opened a forgery on his plantation and he had over 400 enslaved black men and boys um forging between eight and ten thousand nails for him a day and basically used the income from that to fund his lifestyle. Gosh. Uh, from an engineer's perspective, can you explain some of the forces that act upon nails during installation and while they're performing their, their obvious functions? Yeah, I feel like I feel like this audience knows the answer to that question, but I will um I will maybe I can mention the one that surprised me a little bit. So obviously friction is paramount. Um in terms of keeping everything together. The thing that I found really interesting was because I often will whack a nail and then it bends. And I think, oh, that's because I'm hitting it too hard. But then I spoke to one of these more theoretical engineers about this phenomenon, about you know how much force should you be putting onto the nail? And he said, actually, the higher the force you put on it, the less likely it is to buckle. So where, you know, as, as engineers, we have this graph of the strength of steel, what that doesn't really tell us is that the strength of steel, like the resistance of it, actually varies when, when you get to very high forces. So if you really hit it, the strength of the steel, the resistance increases, which is really counterintuitive. Um, and the other thing is that because the the time is such a kind of tiny fraction of a second when you hit it, it's almost like the material doesn't even have time to buckle. So his advice to me was to basically hit the nail as hard as you can <laughs> on the head, as it were. You go on to talk in the book about the warship Mary Rose, which was recovered last century from where she sank in the Solent. Um, what can we learn about the nails used in such wooden craft? So, so this was really beyond my area of expertise, and I really enjoyed going to the museum actually in Portsmouth and um, exploring this. And there was a wonderful engineer there who showed me around, and I think she's now head curator, but she was sort of a specialist in understanding how to preserve um, ancient iron, in a sense. So I think with the Mary Rose, the thing I found really interesting was, I mean, there's a huge variety of different fasteners used. So they used long iron rods where the forces were the biggest. So this was often between, so the hull, um, so, my, so my ship terminology is probably going to be all wrong, but you've got kind of the deck, you've got, I think they they were kind of all, either called the knees or the elbows, and I can't remember which joint it was, big pieces of wood coming in, and where kind of these three different um, parts of the ship uh, interacted, they used big iron nails to kind of tie it together, and this this part would remain above water. So the shipbuilders were really thinking about which material is the right material, depending on its exposure to water. Knees, thank you. Um, I knew it was either the knees or the elbows. Um, I knew somebody then, would know. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I enjoyed about that experience was learning about how the tree nails, so the wooden nails, which were obviously cylindrical, so they don't work in the same way as metal nails, obviously, because you're not using a sharp point to help you penetrate the wood. You actually have to pre-drill a, uh, a hole, you put the thing in, you would then often seal it with flaps um, to protect it. And then when it, when it went into the water, these pegs would actually expand as they got wet and make the connection even tighter. And I really liked that idea that, you know, this piece of design actually gets better when it's being used rather than wearing out or degrading. Absolutely. Uh, can you perhaps talk um, just rather quickly about other fasteners that evolved from the nail and what modern day structures depend on them before we move on to string? Um, absolutely. So uh, the screw also, again, has been around for a while. The screw was actually used for irrigation before it was used for um, fastening. So the ancient Egyptians had 
I mean, we call it the Archimedes screw, but it was actually, Archimedes didn't invent it. He just saw it in Egypt and then brought it to the West, um, which was the giant screw inside a cylinder that was, one end was dipped into water. And then as you turned it, the screw kind of, the threads brought water up and it was used for irrigation. So the idea of the screw has been around for thousands of years. Um, but you had to hand cut the threads and we know that that creates you know inconsistencies between different screws and so on which is not really a problem for a screw but screws are a great one they clamp so they're stronger in a way than the nail i also talk about the rivet the rivet um, was an interesting one so again ancient egyptians made bronze and copper rivets in their vessels so this uh, you know produces that clamping effect and i write about how aircraft were revolutionized by the rivet. Um, and then, of course, my favorite, the nuts and bolts and the washers, can't forget the washers, which, so this is where the hand cutting of threads started to pose a problem because obviously the thread and the nut and the thread and the bolt have to match up. And so they would only be basically produced in pairs when they were handmade. And then, of course, once Maudsley and Whitworth created the metal cutting um, lathe, and mechanization and mass production and all these things came in then suddenly that just opened up this whole world of um you know fasteners that were interchangeable and so i spent a very long time with the steel fabricators on the shard looking at the bolts for every single connection particularly for the top 20 meters of the building which is all exposed steel so the architects were very interested in making it look as good as possible and um yeah, I I had to use a lot of patience. I think there's a lot more computer programming and kind of ways to make it a bit quicker now. But yeah, I spent a few months looking at all the steel connections there. So so yeah, the, the nuts and bolts, which, you know, kind of fit in the palm of your hand, are responsible for holding up a giant skyscraper, which I think is a lovely new thought. Yeah, yeah, something that occurred to me only the other day was how do engineers decide whether to use multiple thin bolts or very few very large bolts we've all seen the these large lorries they use in open cast mines with huge wheels and have maybe a hundred small bolts holding the wheels on and other things that have got a few enormous bolts yeah so it's it's a mixture between i guess the practicality of doing them all up and there'll be an element of cost involved as well there'll be an element of how close together the different bolts can be because you know if you're using an m20 bolt for example then you need to give it enough space um to work because if the two bolts are too close together then they don't you don't get the full capacity out of both of them so I, it's a bit of a kind of balance between all of the above and i think when we're thinking about the spire as well we were thinking about i mean so you, you might have seen those steel connections when two beams come up and then there's these long thin plates extending down because you want to try and fit as many bolts as you can yeah but with this exposed steel we very much wanted to have the ends very clean and so we were trying to make sure that the number of bolts was i guess on the lower side so that we could minimize the amount of space the connection took up great well let's let's move on from nails um, maybe some other people have got questions later on. Uh, let's move on to string then. I know your first full-time job involved the maths behind the Northumbria University Bridge, um, but uh, can you explain how string related to that? <laughs> um, yeah, so so as it happens, I'm a big crocheter and I've, I've got some random bits of thread lying around today. So I don't know how about my camera's not a very high definition camera, but you can kind of, so this yarn i'm using at the moment has four strands yeah if you can see that but yeah there's four that, yeah. strands on that and they are twisted which way are these twisted so this is an s twist which means if you hold it up you can see like an s the line of the twist going in that direction but then each one of these strands is itself a twisted group of yeah in um fibers and threads and those are twisted in the opposite direction so you're basically trying to create these opposing layers of twist to create the piece of yarn which is really strong so it's just this like fiddly little thing 
which I can fold up and scrunch in. But then if I pull it, it's really, really strong. And I think string was actually probably the most surprising to me of my seven. But I, I said, hold on, they actually are an incredible piece of engineering. And I start the story of string. Luckily, archaeologists, as I was writing this chapter, discovered a tiny little piece of, of string that was created by the Neanderthals in France. They found a tool with a string, a piece of string that was about half a centimeter long and about half a millimeter wide. And it had strands that were twisted up in exactly the same way that I've shown you today. Maybe the number was different. And it says something about their cognitive abilities, about the fact that they're thinking about, well, um, we need to oppose it because otherwise it just unravels. It's, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. And then I thought about the biggest bridges in the world. And those are made up of lots of strands of steel wire. And the biggest suspension bridges have parallel strands of wire, but you also very often get structures that are held up by essentially metal wire in in, the, in that configuration. And so that for me was that connection between a tiny piece of Neanderthal string to some of the biggest bridges in the world. Gosh, oh, talking of bridges, can you tell us about that? And excuse the pronunciation, Kreswataka Bridge in Peru? <laughs> um, yeah, so I am i don't think I can pronounce it much better than that, but this is a bridge. So, so the Inca Empire was obviously in this extraordinarily mountainous region. And I think the way the mountains ran, they had this long road that traveled from north to south. But there was a big ravine next to it. And then there was another sort of, I guess, part of that range on the other side of the ravine in particular places. And so bridges were really important in order for people to be able to communicate and trade and and so on and so they this particular bridge is one of the ones the bridge itself is renewed every year but a bridge of the form has been in place for about 500 years and it's made out of local grass so what tends to happen is that the women braid the grass and they create the ropes and then the men um pull on the ropes and sling it across the valley. And then they basically, I mean, it looks like a terrifying job to me, but they get the main four pieces of rope across the valley and then they straddle that and take two more. So they have six in total, four at the low level, two at the high level. And then they create essentially a U shape with smaller pieces of rope. Um, and over time, that grass degrades and gets frayed and so on. And then they basically every year cut it out so that it falls down into the gorge and, and renew it. And this is a tradition that's been carried on, as I said, for um, yeah about 500 years. Golly. Yeah, it does sound a dangerous job. The, <laughs> the construction of that is very different from, uh, we've got some friends on here from America, thinking of the Brooklyn Bridge. That's very different. How is that um, constructed? So I love the Brooklyn Bridge and I've given a whole chapter to the Brooklyn Bridge, but actually the woman behind the Brooklyn Bridge in my first book built. So this was now the first suspension bridge in the world that used steel fibers. So in, you know, almost in a similar way to the, what, what I described. So the, the huge cables, the two main huge cables that go between the towers are made from, I can't remember, it was over 200 strands of wire that were slung back and forth and then kind of clamped together and then hundreds of more wires were used to suspend the deck and so on so yeah, as i said it was the first it was the longest suspension bridge of its time as long as bridge of its time suspension bridge first one to use steel fibers and um, the project was the brainchild of john rogling who was a G german immigrant to the us and he built some other big bridges around the us so when the cities of Brooklyn and Manhattan, at the time they were separate cities, said that, look, we need to do something about our two cities, connecting them better. So he came up with the idea of the bridge. He unfortunately died because of an accident on site. He contracted tetanus. And then his son, who was also a civil engineer, took over the project. 
and then he got the bends or like compression sickness because he was going up and down. So he created these watertight caissons, which sat at the bottom of the river, and they were constructing the foundations from the inside of these caissons. And it was the first time that these had been used, like pressurized caissons. But because he was going up and down so many times a day, he got decompression sickness, became very disabled and ill. And then his wife, Emily Roebling, who had been lucky enough to actually be educated, because again, at the time, that was not something a lot of women had access to. She took over the project and then spent 11 years essentially project managing the project. So she did everything from the calculations for the cables, the material testing, speaking to the laborers on site, speaking to the politicians and the funders, everything, the full spectrum of work. And so, yeah, so that's definitely a special bridge for me for, for that reason. <laughs> Using threads and fibers differently, tell us about Stephanie Kwolek and her work at DuPont. Yeah, so Stephanie Kwolek was a Polish immigrant and she actually wanted to become a doctor, but it was very expensive. So I'm taking you back to about the 1940s, I think. Um, and it was very expensive to pay for a medical degree. So she decided to study chemistry instead. And then when the war happened and a lot of men were called away, jobs opened up at the chemical company DuPont and they started hiring women because they had to fill these roles. And so she got a job there. So she was working on the development of fibers for racing cars because they used to use steel to reinforce the tires of racing cars, but obviously that's heavy. So they were they tasked her with looking at different polymers and different artificial fibers. And then she created Amex, which she thought, oh, this is actually quite a faulty batch because the consistency was wrong, the color was wrong. She said, you know what, I'm just going to put it through the normal process anyway and just see what comes out. And then what came out was this incredibly strong fiber. And it was probably one of those moments where she looked at that and went, oh my goodness, I've done it. Like I've created this incredibly strong material. So we know that now as Kevlar, please don't ask me what the chemical name for it is because it's a very complicated polyethylene kind of name. Um, but it, it's an incredible, it's an extraordinarily strong material and it's used in the thermal insulation that is worn by firefighters, for example, by the police, sometimes by, you know, miners, and, and also for bulletproof vests. So it's incredibly light, incredibly strong. And I, I just find this idea that a piece of fiber or string can stop a bullet in its tracks quite mind blowing. Uh, that's interesting. I was just about to ask you what was the most exciting discovery. Maybe that's a contender for it. Um, for my book, you mean in general? From, like, the, from the book, um, yeah. Which, yes, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I really love this. So I think this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've got an idea. I've got the answer. So my most exciting discovery was actually a. A particular scientist called Ibn al Haytham, who was one of the Islamic scientists from a thousand years ago, which we you know we talk about, we call them the Dark Ages in the West, but actually it was the Golden Age of Islamic science in the Middle East. And I had never heard of him, but, you know, having considering that I studied a physics degree, he was the one who figured out how our eyes work, how light enters our eyes and sight works. He, he explained that light had a finite speed. He explained that they travel in straight lines. He created the first ever pinhole camera. So, and he documented all of this work 700 years before Newton had done any of his work on optics. But yet we don't know him and we don't know his name. Um, you know, considering, like I said, that I've done a degree in physics, I've never heard of him. And so I think he was my favorite discovery actually of, of in, in the whole book. Thank you very much, Roma. Uh, I found that fascinating, even though I've already read the book. Um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few questions from others in the group, if you're able to stay with us for a little while. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and you know, I've really enjoyed watching many of you working in your workshops. It's such a joy to, to, have, yeah, to see that. <laughs> I love it. OK, Srenik, I was the first to go, so. Uh, good evening, Roma. Hang on, let me yeah, add, my, add my spotlight, then you can see me as well. There we go. Um, good evening. Um, fascinating talk and quite exciting as I work in infrastructure as well. 
So um, I guess my question was uh, maybe drawing away from the physical um, use of those fixings, but I was actually wondering about some of the projects where, as you were saying, you were trying to reduce the number of bolts. Do you ever find yourself battling with um, with cost when it comes to how many bolts you structurally need and um, and how many bolts the QS wants you to use? I mean, no, because the QS knows better than to tell me, you know, tell us not to put enough bolts in because obviously like robustness and safety is number one. Um, where we have had more battles was, I, I, put, I mean, one example that comes straight to my head was I was working on a train station where they were putting these new columns up. And obviously you can buy rolled standard column sizes, but because they're rolled, they, the corners are a bit curved. And the architect wanted sharp corners, so they asked for fabricated columns so that you get these really, really sharp corners. And the QS was just like, eh, not having that. <laughs> so there are definite, um, there are definitely discussions to be had with the QS, but not over the number of bolts. Has that been your experience? Uh, I've had that once, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. Tell us what QS is. Uh, quantity surveyor. All oh, right. Yeah. I mean, design side, you're probably cost, referring more to a cost, cost consultant. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's move on to Matthias then. Right. Uh, good evening. And thank you so much for, for joining us and for a fascinating talk. I absolutely loved it. Uh, first couple of, well, two things that you mentioned during your talk. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Have you seen the Roebling Bridge? I haven't, not that in person. No, it's uh, in in Cincinnati, across the Ohio River. And apparently it is basically the Brooklyn Bridge written small and was built before. It's it's a beautiful bridge. If you ever get a chance, it's worth uh, walking across and having a look at. Uh, also about the strength of fibrous materials to stop a bullet. Uh, I was fascinated to learn on a recent visit to the Japan House in London, they had an exhibition on uh, Japanese plated bands, which apparently were used, among other things, for making samurai armor. So, so the technique goes back quite a way. It's uh, quite a way, it seems. But so sorry, uh, what did you say they were? They were plated what? Uh, plated bands. So bands plated from from what well, string from yarn. Okay, so no, I didn't come across that. Thank you. I'll, I'll definitely no, look so, that up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it was a beautiful exhibition. I don't know if it, it might still be on at, at Japan House in, in London, but right. even if it's not, uh, so those bands apparently are most known for being the belt worn around kimonos. But uh, if you, as it were, mul multiply, if, if you plate them in the right way and, and add them to each other, they make quite efficient armor, it seems. Amazing. I, th I think yeah. I've just realised that you, you mean plat, do you, Matthias? Yeah, plat, yes. Ah, yeah, okay. Ah, yes. Apparent, uh, apologies for the for the pronunciation. Oh, no, you just had me confused. I expect everyone else knew what you were talking about. Yeah. First year in two years. I think we should yeah. celebrate that. But anyway, uh, to ask you a, more of a, well, not a proper question, uh, but uh, nuts and bolts, do you have a favourite standard for threads and if so why <laughs> you know i have been asked that question once before and i mean the answer is no i'm not really bothered but i know that this is a very passionate discussion among some people mm -hmm. um <laughs> shrenix obviously got a, um, a favorite there yeah um i think yeah whatever's whatever works to be honest i'm happy with so <laughs> yeah uh but but uh, and as a follow-up to that question is the one that theoretically at least is from an engineering point of view more sound than any of the others or are they basically all equals i mean do jim and shrenik have views on this i mean you've obviously got strong views on um why you like the particular threads. i don't know i i i've only ever used the metric threads that we have now so yeah. I've you know that kind of now 
persist. And I know that it's not necessarily the case that they're necessarily the best engineering solution. Sometimes politics and power and money and all these things become involved in why that choice was made. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I'm 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 for me, I'm quite practical as long as it works. It works. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, it, it it was a bit of a silly question, but but uh, but also a, a genuine piece of curiosity. Not not so much if you have a favorite, because favorites you can have for for whatever reason. Uh, but but if if one actually at least in theory, would be better than any other because, of course, it, it is, I, I assume, uh, a balancing of various things, uh, pitch and gauge and, and whatever. So I, I feel like your colleagues in the room probably can answer that better than I can. Right. I think maybe it's a case of horses for courses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my, my favourite is whatever I can get my hands on. But, yeah. but anyway, thank you so much. And thank you again thank for coming you. to talk to us. Thank you. joining. Okay, let's go over to Sean. No, it's not actually me. I have two young ladies with me who wanted to ask. Ah, okay. Oh, very it... happy to see you both. Uh, if you could, if you could only have one of the seven, which one would it be? That's a great question. Um, so I think that our and like the world that we live in now, all the engineering around us, modern life requires all seven. So we couldn't kind of create our world without any one of them. But my favorite, I think, is string. Now, I can see a very cool, what it look, looks to me like a crocheted animal that you're holding. Did somebody make that for you? My dad made it. It's a dog. It's a dog. That's fun, fantastic. So I'm going to just bend over and show you what I'm making at the moment. Um, so this is <laughs> a crocheted. This is the back of a jumper. Um, and this is my inner child with lemons and watermelons. You like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to make sure that I get a picture sent to you when I actually finish it. Oh, you've got one as well. That's brilliant. Astrid, do you have a question you want to ask? How does pump change world in midway? Huh? How does... How does the pump change in store in the midway? I don't... I'm sorry, honey. I can't hear you properly. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what, I'll put it in, I'll figure it out in a minute and put it in the chat and then we'll see if we can come back to it. Okay. 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 We'll come back to you, Sean. Well, well done, Dada, for the amazing crochet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Let's pop over to Richard. Uh, yeah, good Good evening, um, Roma. Thanks Thanks for uh, coming to, to speak to us tonight. Um, uh, I've seen you uh, uh, quite a few times on on television on the abandoned engineering program. Um, would you like to tell us a little a bit about your television career, how you got into it, and uh, and uh, did you find? I, I imagine it's great fun, really, traveling here and there, and 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 dis discovering these these wonders of the past and uh, and unearthing their story. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's less glam glamorous than it appears, to be honest with you. But um, so how did I get into it? I got into it because Channel 4 or 5, Channel 5, I think, was doing a documentary on the Shard back in 2012. And so they interviewed a few of us engineers for that program to try and explain some of the engineering challenges. Um, I'm not sure if that's still available, but yes, it's 11 years old now, this, that documentary. And they interviewed me and a number of my colleagues and cut them all out, left me in. And I think it was because I was enthusiastic and excited and explained the complex engineering things in a way that people could understand using analogies and so on. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of went from there, really. I start, I did, I've done bits of like live television where I've been interviewed about, you know, like today the A-level results came out. So in the past, they've gone and spoken about that sort of stuff, about how many girls were studying physics, for example, or DMT, you know, DMT in general. Um, abandoned engineering I've done quite a few seasons of sadly I don't get to go to any of the locations for that particular series <laughs> okay, yeah, I, okay. I usually sit in a studio in East London and get nice pictures to look at and information about them that I digest and then discuss on camera okay. However, oh, well, uh, I'm, I'm very yeah, disappointed so. to hear that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it's it's a shame but, the, but that's that's budgets and um, and so on but 
I have now just signed up for a documentary that I can't say a huge amount about, but I am exploring some of the connections between a Renaissance artist and the Islamic world, which is so fascinating. And for that, I have been able to travel and I've been to Istanbul and I'll be going to LA and Egypt later this year. So I'm very, very excited about that. And yeah, I love doing that. I also have a podcast, by the way, um, in case any of you are interested, called Create the Future. So I did Building Stories, which has three episodes, three or four episodes. The Create the Future is a kind of ongoing one, and it talks about the future of engineering from lots of different perspectives. And there's, there's even an episode on knitting in that, just to keep everyone happy, and baking. Okay, um, and where, where are they? Where, how do we find these um, these casts? So it, uh, it should be on any of the platforms like Apple's, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or and any of those or the website okay. itself and i can i yeah. can send i mean they're all on my website which is roma the engineer.com but i can stick some links into the chat if that's helpful yeah, yeah. okay thank you knowing this group there'll yeah. be a link on the in the chat very soon <laughs> I, i've just uh, heard that astrid's question sean's daughter was how did pumps change the world in a big way he's got the book so she's been looking at the cover oh fantastic and I would like to tell the two young women on the call that there's a children's version of Nuts and Bolts coming out next year, but it's still a year away. But there will be a children's version with amazing illustrations. Um, pumps are very important because they move. So pumps are machines that move gases and liquids. And the most important liquid there is for us is water. And we've been using pumps to bring water to us for drinking, for hygiene and to for agriculture, to grow food. And so pumps have played an extraordinarily important part in our civilization and the way we've lived and the way we've grown food and so on. Um, so that's one way they're very important. I write about a couple of other pumps. One is the, the pumps that are in the astronaut suits that allow us to basically go out of our atmosphere. So, you know, the pump allowing us to do things with our body that's not possible otherwise. And I talk about the heart, which is also, you know, probably the most complicated pump there is. Um, and what, what do you do if your heart doesn't work very well and you need surgery? And the fact that we created an external pump that can do the work of our heart and lungs while surgery happens. So there's, yeah, there's lots of amazing things that pumps can do. So thank you, Astrid. Fantastic. And let's pop over to Murto. <laughs> Um, hello, thank you very much for this. I, I really enjoyed uh, the, your your talk. Um, I, I have a, a, a little question. I've been looking at the history of tools and techniques and I still haven't found, found out in a definitive way when um, screws started being used as fasteners. I mean, I'm aware that the, the, the concept of a screw, it was common in antiquity, uh, but did they uh, start getting used as fasteners uh, only recently? Because that's that's what I'm that's what I keep finding. I don't know if it's right. Yeah, no. I, so this is a very interesting question, and it's a really tricky one. And I and I think you're correct in that it is a relatively recent phenomenon. Like it's not. I don't think it was used as a fastener going back sort of two to four thousand years. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a book which is about the screwdriver. I don't know if you've come across uh, that book. Uh, One good turn. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, that would be the source that I would direct you to, to be yeah. honest. I, I wouldn't know where else to look. But, you know, I, it's, it's often very difficult to find kind of this is when this particular piece of technology started. Mm -hmm. um, just because, again, all over the world, it's going to be different, different technologies, different materials and so on. And a lot of the information gets lost, but but I would say that that's probably a good place to start. And I don't know the question to answer that question either. I'm just really interesting you're talking about tools and techniques because I think that's probably going to be what I'll investigate in my next book. Is mm -hmm. um, yeah, like the stuff that allows us to make other stuff. So yeah, maybe we can have a chat sometime. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I'd love that. Thank you. Thank you. I've got yeah, something here to show. Have you got me? Yeah, yeah. A, great, a great big structural bolt. This I worked for a small film company in the early 1970s, and uh, they were we were making a film for a Sheffield company who made structural 
uh, bolts for structural steel work. Amazing. And I think these were the ones we, we did some filming on were to do with the um, Drax power station chimney, I think. But what uh, the, the, their thing was, and I don't know if you can see this, but the, the washer uh, had these indents, indents in the one side, so you had protrusions on the other side. And what they were doing then, when they were tightening this up, they were collapsing these shapes and checking it with a feeler gauge. And when you got to a certain gap, then the tension across the bolt was correct. Yeah. And they used massive torque wrenches upon the steel work to do this. So I don't know what the steel directors thought of all this, because it looked <laughs> quite hard. to. I mean, these torque wrenches were maybe, uh, I don't know, four foot long or even maybe six foot long, you know. And more recently, I mean, I've never seen anything about these since. Uh, but more recently, I've stoked spoken to uh, uh, people who were erecting steel uh, frames for agricultural buildings. And I was telling him about this story and saying, you know, how do you know how to tight, how tight is tight? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me as I was just stupid. He says, well, we just tighten them so they won't go any tighter. <laughs> and I didn't, I think he was just using average size sort of tools, wrenches, for the particular size of bolt, that sort of thing. So uh, they were hand tightening, I think. They weren't using power tightening. Um, I mean, they, this, this wasn't giant steel work, but you know, the sort of thing for a farm building. Um, so I just wondered, um, have you got any thoughts about, well, you know, what, how do they tighten these things accurately these days? And is it a big issue or not? Um, yeah, so I, I don't, know that I it's so, so it depends is the answer so I have come across bolts like that um because you know as you say they create that tension and you need to kind of talk them in and they require a huge amount of force to depress those dimples um there are also bolts that are called high strength friction grip bolts HSFG and they will have they tend to have I, I don't I don't know exactly what the tool is and how, I mean, it's, it's what, how the wrench works, but you have to keep tightening it. And then once it comes to the right torque, it, it kind of slips. All so right. you know that you've, re you've reached the right amount of, yeah. Thing, yeah. of force to basically tighten that bolt up. Yeah. Which is but how that that's... torque wrenches work, isn't it? That's, I think. Yes, I, I yeah. guess so. I've yeah. never done one myself, but right. with the high strength friction grip bolts, you know, as you said, you have to get the right amount of force into it. Whereas with the normal bolts, normal uh, washers, you, you just, I think what the guy was saying kind of makes sense is that you tighten them up till they're tight. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but my tight might be different than your tight might be different right. to his tight. Sure, yeah. So that, you know, yeah. that consistency yeah. um, doesn't sound <laughs> very promising. But yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's those those special wrenches which kind of start to slip once you reach the right force, which right. is the trick for yeah. the really kind of yeah. critical faults. As I say, on on this big steel work, you know, the, the torque wrench, which which did, they, they weren't breaking, the torque wasn't breaking, uh, they were using the feeler gauge. So it yes. was just a giant, oh, sure. a giant wrench. Uh, uh, certainly, maybe one and a half meters long. You know? <laughs> I mean, that the but that bolt you've got there is a monster. It is a monster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was plated for filming purposes. It wasn't. They weren't manufactured with this plating on. They were normal sure. looking. Yeah. That was me thinking you just got bored one evening and polished it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's uh, slip over to Jim, who's got the final question. I think. Oh, I'm final tonight. Hi, Roma. How are you? Hi, I'm I'm very well. Nice to see you. I apologise for the outfit. I mean, I, I I read the the title and it said nuts and bolts, so I thought I'd put my boiler suit on. So it's... <laughs> that's ex that's excellent. No, I'm joking. Um, this is Alfie, by the way. He's the star of the show. Hello, hello. Um, uh, fascinating talk. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and um, just to to um finish off what Ian was saying there that. Uh, 
Um, there are all sorts of ways of tightening bolts. And there's even, you know, in, in the motor industry, they've got stretch bolts and engines, which you stretch them and, um, you know, to a certain torque. And then they're not used again. Once you dismantle it, you've got to put a new one in. And that that, that sure. whole thing. But that's a Ian subject. Um, I noticed twice during your talk that you mentioned, shall we say, I'd like to call it plagiaristic colonial invention. So you know where I'm going with this, that there are, for instance, Newton, um, um, he didn't invent those those um, things. Archimedes borrowed the concept that we knew as the Archimedes drill, i.e. the pump, the lift. Um, do you think those people were clever enough? I know Newton was a, a, was a Freemason, um, grandmaster, in fact. And do you think those people knew... Um, intellectually within a circle history in other worlds that because uh, we seem to think and I, this has happened a lot for instance the invention of television i know there's a couple of scots here that would would argue that um you know john yogi bear didn't um didn't invent the television um but uh my point is, with with the people that are, are claimed to have invented something in the modern world, and by modern I mean the last two, centu two uh, centuries, um, do you think they 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 knew about the invention from time either culturally displaced or t time temporarily displaced, um, and then they they came up and invented it for the royal society or whatever? Do you think that's what's happening here or do you think it's just um time synchronicity that they've come up with the same idea but a long time afterwards i think there's an element of the former so i know for example i mean people say that newton and many of his contemporaries hook you know people like that were not particularly nice people right and there were all kinds of rivalries and trying to tear each other down and so i'm my understanding is that there is no lasting portrait of robert hook because they've been burnt and destroyed by his um you know by his rivals basically so there was a lot of this there was a very cutthroat sentiment i think with a lot of it alexander graham bell is a good example who you know he did he didn't invent television first necessarily there was somebody who filed a patent hours after he did. Um, but he gets all the credit for it. And so uh, so there's a lot of, I think... The telephone, the telephone you mean. The telephone, sorry. Um, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that I think has come through because people had enough money or the status or the privilege to file and obtain patents, whereas other people didn't. Um, so, so I write about Josephine Cochran, who was an American woman who got a patent, and that was that was quite unusual for a woman to be given a patent. So, it, you know, it, 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 what I'm trying to say is that it wasn't a meritocracy. It was based on who had the right lawyers, who had enough money, who had the documentation, and and so on to achieve those things. And then the television, as you brought up, was is an interesting one because I actually found records of a Japanese inventor that invented the whole the first all electric television before Baird and Farnsworth. Um but he never applied for a patent. And because in in Japan they didn't have the same Western approach to patents and then his records got destroyed in the Second World War. I found the story of Jagdish Chandra Bose, who was an um, an Indian scientist who lived under the colonial British rule. And he invented a device called the Cohera, without which radio wouldn't have existed. But we only know of Marconi in Italy as the inventor of the radio, but he used a Cohera because you couldn't interpret electromagnetic signals without Bose's work. And so, I mean, there are countless stories of people, you know, whose contributions are not either recorded or are unknown in the West. And I have tried to highlight a few of those in my writing yeah but that's 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 the important thing i'm thinking about because i i'm i'm a great believer in the um civilization started in the in the east and uh you know we, we, we talk about china now but the china before the great empire of china um is just one example um uh 
and and particularly some of the um you know um Greek, uh, grecian and um, uh, um from mesopotamia and all the inventions that have been lost in time or or inverted commas lost because i think a lot of it is discoverable and is becoming more and more discoverable and then we find out that something we thought was was discovered um you know in in the 20th century was in fact discovered in you know in the 10th century bc in the middle of nowhere um because that because of the communication um the lack of communication between the the the, the two cultures and also because of um an arrogance i think that the the it, it must have been invented the great you know the great empires of britain the netherlands uh, spain they couldn't possibly have been invented elsewhere because those are, are heathens and you know and uh, religion's got a lot to do with it so i think i think we're discovering more and more now as we we dig up certain you know archaeologically um i think you know things like the antikythera mechanism in 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 uh you know having been discovered as the first calculator going back to aristotle um is just um is just absolutely amazing and it's a fascinating subject so i'm going to get the book because i, I was unaware thank and thank you mitch for letting me become aware of that i've got i've got the um uh, uh, the turns turning the screw book but that was fascinating probably one of the best books i've read in fact so i'm sure this one will surpass that thank you roma thanks oh, thank thanks very much thanks jim and it's nice to see you back here yeah i just i fell asleep after the, i fell asleep under the car and fell asleep in here because i've not been sleeping well but yeah but uh, now if he's taking my shift so Okay, so Roma, thank you so much for being so generous with your time this evening. We've really enjoyed it, as you can tell. Um, you're very welcome to stay on uh, for the rest of the evening, if you like, and to join us any week you like. It's the same link every time. Oh, I appreciate that, Mitch. Um, I Was there any last questions before I... I Shred, if you've got your hand up again, just if I can squeeze one last one before I disappear. Um, so, yeah, I had one question. And it was leading on from, I was going to ask it and then I thought, I'll leave it. And then um, Jim sort of went into it anyway. And I guess it's a follow up to that, which is obviously you spent time in India when you were younger. Um, but through your research, I know that looking at physics, astrophysics, for example, in the Indus Valley, the scriptures which show all the planets. So we know that even before the Greeks had the, the, talked about them, there was knowledge of some sort of solar system in the Indus Valley. Have you come across anything of that age um, from from the from the East in your research? Um, I I didn't I don't think I went I saw anything that far back because I think that's more like you say the physics science side of things and I was focusing more on physical engineering things. I think like for me personally the biggest revelation was the Islamic golden age of science. Like I know that the Chinese civilization, I know, it, I know about in this valley kind of drainage systems, for example, um, you know, Mesopotamia had incredible structures and so on. So, so I understand that side of things. But for me, with the Islamic golden age of science, the narrative, I think, more generally in the West, is that what the Islamic scholars did was to preserve Greek texts, translate them, they get destroyed in the West and then eventually they pass them back. And I don't think there's any credit given for all the original work that was done in the Islamic Golden Age of Science. And for me, that was really the sort of the revelation. Um, and I really enjoyed, so, you know, if I've only picked one name, but I've, I've got another two names that I mention in the book and I'm going to explore another one of a woman who used to make astrolabes. Um, and she used to work in the courts of the Syrian rulers um, because she was so skilled in doing that, for example. But I mean, there are there are so many stories. And I've got a friend who's got a book coming out in February, which is called Uncivilized. And I'll again, I'll see if I can find a link. I'll just drop a few links before I pop out. Um, and she talks about a lot of this kind of stuff that you know vaccines for example being actually developed in africa and um, via smallpox and so on way before it was ever done in the west and 
like she she covers it in a much broader sense of society, not just in engineering. But yeah, there's there's lots of very interesting stories out there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could I, could I just jump jump in, Roma, and just see if you know about this book? I'll, I'll fly the flag for Tools and Trades History Society. And this is their latest publication. So it's Historic French Nails and Fixings. Um, this is another edition that's been updated. And um, I think, do you call it a bridge by Mr. Howe, the Dr. Howe? But um, there's some very, very interesting stuff in that. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. <clears throat> right. Well, I will bring the meeting to a... Uh, <laughs> to the in interview to a close and um, we'll oh, have our I... regular toast to the bench if we can oh, okay so raise your glasses to the bench and absent friends and all they work on to the bench and absent friends <laughs>